this on just so the people online can see or see <laughs> see better with a microphone <laughs> don't laugh I'm nervous <laughs> is anyone as nervous as I am <laughs> my man we got the same haircut yeah well hey what an honor it is to be here with uh, Church for the Lost and Found in Dublin Texas uh, we drove a, just short of 1500 miles last week uh, to be here with y'all um, see, I'm learning how to use the word y'all. Um, uh, and, well, actually, that would, the proper term would be all y'all, right? Because there's more than so many. Anyways, um, it's cool. Uh, my name is Ryan Mitchell, uh, born and raised in Tulare, California. Um, God called me to ministry uh, early on, but like the human that I am, I ran from it for years. Uh, but God always catches you uh, when you need it the most. Um, I'm not the only one here. My wife, Jennifer, is here, uh, my daughter, Emma, and my son, Eli. Uh, I like how they get a clap. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. There you go. Thank you. See? Um, no, like, they are the reason why I get to do what I get to do, because they are a part of the ministry that uh, I've been um, so blessed to be uh, in. Um, and what an honor it is to, to be speaking to you, not only, um, like I was able to speak online for Easter, but 50 days later, count that, 50 days later for Pentecost Sunday. That's this weekend, that's today. Uh, the day that God gifted us something that we could not pass up on, on doing ministry. And so, you know, let's just jump right into it. After the Q&A, you guys can ask me any question you want. Um, I'll try to answer it to the best of my abilities. If I don't know the answer, I have no problem saying I don't know. Um, but Mike probably does, or Keith would know. Someone would know. Um, but We don't want to make it up. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's what I don't want to do. I don't want to make it up. Um, anyways, uh, today we're going to talk. I mean, why not? It's Pentecost Sunday, the gift of the Holy Spirit. So why not just go straight to the text? Yeah. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. And it says this. We're going to kind of tie in to, to quite a bit. Um, I'm going to try to do my best to not add all these rabbit trails um, into the message, but, but with it, um, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. I actually put it in my iPad so it'd be bigger because as I've gotten a little older, um, those words get a little blurry. Oh, yeah. And now I have glasses. So, But I'm going to read straight from Scripture. Um, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will... Uh, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Uh, what's cool about that is that is, is Jesus' command of the Great Commission for us as believers to uh, spread the gospel. Um, and this is the area where most believers fall short. Uh, one, we get comfortable, right? We get into our routines. Uh, you know, Monday we do this, Tuesday we do this, Wednesday we do this. It, it becomes a routine. It becomes comfortable. Uh, but, but God doesn't want us to be comfortable. Uh, teenagers go to camps, right? How many teenagers are here? Got one, two. Wow, we got teenagers, right? Um, the cool thing about going to camp or a convention or a men's retreat or a women's retreat or a church service is, is a lot of times you walk away with a God high, right? You're, you're high on God. You're invincible, like, you can do anything. Churchgoers are uh, attending a church on service every Sunday to be uh, groomed for the week so that they can go out and do what God's calling them to do, whether it be at their home or, or their, their workplace or their school. Um, see, when you leave the, the place where you're comfortable, God is allowed to work through you in a mighty way because we rely on him more and more. The enemy knows when God is moving in your life. Because when God is moving, all of these attacks come at you. And God knew that this was going to happen, so he had to gift us somebody that was going to empower us and stand firm when we are so weak. And that was the Holy Spirit. Jesus never said to follow me and all your suffering, all your worry, and all your pain will go away. He never said that. Actually, he said... I guarantee you will have hardship. You will be persecuted. The world does not like the gospel because it contradicts everything that the world's about. 
He tells us to pick up our cross daily and follow him. But we have to understand, as as believers, the moment that we accept Jesus as our Savior and receive the Holy Spirit within us, we're no longer of the world. We just have to live in it. We weren't created to be comfortable sitting in a church service, in a pew, um, at a camp or a youth group or in a Bible study. We weren't meant to be comfortable in these aspects. We were meant to be empowered and embodied by other believers so that when we leave the doors and go out into our homes, into our communities, into our schools and our workplaces, we are empowered to spread the gospel by more than just our words, but by our actions. He calls us to a lifetime of serving guided by the Holy Spirit. A lifetime of serving guided by the Holy Spirit. If you are living your life not guided by the Holy Spirit, you are setting your life up for failure. Now, you may be successful in the world's aspect, but in the godly aspect, the one that really matters, you're going to fail. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, it says, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for my gift, uh, the gift that my Father promised, uh, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You see me, Ryan, you, uh, your name. (laughs) I only know a handful of you, so uh, you get the idea. We are not strong enough to go into the world on our own and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. We need help. We need that empowerment that the Holy Spirit offers, and only the Holy Spirit can offer. We cannot go into our Jerusalem, our Judea, or our Samaria, or to the ends of the earth without the Holy Spirit. It's not possible. Well, I guess it is possible, but you're not going to do any good. You see the Jerusalem. In biblical terms, that was where they were at presently. That's their home. So maybe it's in your home. Maybe you are the only believer in your home, or or there are people that are kind of like not really on board with it. But you get to be the Holy Spirit deliverer of Jesus in your home, in your Jerusalem. You see, and then your Judea. How many of you guys go to school? Well, before the whole pandemic, right? You went to school. uh, You went to work. How many of us have jobs? Please raise your hand because I don't want to be the only one. uh, Okay, we got some participants. Your Judea is your work. The place that you're at a whole lot of times that's not too far from home. You have an ability to spread the gospel there whether they like it or not because it's your actions. I was always taught that actions speak louder than words. And so don't tell me what you're good at. Show me what you're good at kind of thing. Right? Because I could tell you that I'm like the best basketball player ever if it was called to not make the the ball into the hoop. Like... (laughs) If air balls were worth points, I'm your man. I can't make a layup to save my life. Your Samaria. Your Samaria is your town. Your Samaria is your community. How are you furthering the gospel of Jesus Christ in your community? And to the ends of the earth, wherever you go. You go on vacation, you don't go on vacation from the word. You don't go on vacation from the church. You go on vacation from the church building. But you are the church. Many of us here probably haven't been to church since like March 15th. I think it was the last real day. Maybe even before that. I know last week I was blessed to to come into a church building and just to sit back there in the back. Someone took my seat. Um, But just to be. And the worship was so anointed. Like the spirit was heavy and powerful. And I felt empowered. I can go and I can can accomplish whatever God puts in front of me. You see, you need to become a spark in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your school or on campus. Or no matter where you go. These will begin to lead. You will begin to lead in these places as long as you get that spark. Right? And without a spark, you can't have any type of ignition or some fire. Right? And in Acts, it says that, that the Holy Spirit came down like a fire. 
and engulfed them. And, and there was, it was swirling around their heads and they were speaking in other tongues. Would that not have been something? Like, I would have pulled out my iPhone and recorded all this. Because, like, I would have been YouTube famous. But they will lead you to God's treasured people, or this will, whenever you, you, you get this spark, um, to God's treasured people who have never heard the gospel or who have turned from Christianity because they've been hurt. Right? Have you guys ever been hurt by someone in the church? They said something. They've done something. Uh, the pastor said something. Like, that hurt my feelings. Well, that's no longer being like, I'm offended. That's conviction. Because a lot of times, it may be delivered in a wrong way that really does hurt. But step back and think, how is God speaking to me through that? We need to stop being the Christians non-believers see that we are and start being the Christians that Jesus died for us to be. But we can't do that without the Holy Spirit. Right? It's time to make an even greater, an even greater commitment to the Great Commission. Right? The, the name of the church, Church for the Lost and Found. It's not just for the found. Amen. It's for the lost. The, the lost come first. Yeah. As a church, as a body of Christ, when you step into it, it's no longer about you. Sure. It's about them. Yeah, good. It's no longer about you. It's about the person sitting next to you. It's no longer about you. It's about that person that won't come because they're hurt. At what point as a, a believer in Christ do you reach out to them and say, you know what, so-and-so? I miss you and I love you. Yeah, that's good. Because honestly, they may not realize that uh, the person that hurt them may not realize that they are hurt by what they said. Good. You see, revival in people today won't happen just by an invitation. Hey, why don't you come to church and hear what the pastor has to say? That's not the culture of society anymore. We have to get out into the community and go get them. It's the only way to reach people today. People trust differently today because they have access to everything on the Internet. Right? Stepping into this, this opportunity to come and present myself and, and the gospel to you guys to possibly come here for good, I've done my homework. And it's been postponed twice. This is the third attempt to get us here because of the pandemic. I've had plenty of time to do my homework. You don't ever go somewhere without understanding what you're getting yourself into. I was that Facebook stalker. If there's someone there, like, I looked them up. I, I put a face with a name. I think I told Keith that the other day. I was like, Keith, I knew what you looked like because uh, I looked you up. And the picture was real intimidating. <laughs> But come to find out, he's one of the nicest, gentle guys with a, a, an amazing voice and an amazing heart. You see, revival starts with you. And you are empowered by the Holy Spirit. And, and it decides to co commit yourself. You decide to commit yourself to doing what you are called to do as a believer in Christ. You see, because my calling is different than your calling. Your calling is different than someone else's calling. And if we all step into our calling, we all begin to reach people where we're at for the gospel that Jesus has, has died for, right? Here's an example. Paul and Barnabas. One of my favorite things, right? Paul was formerly Saul, killed Christians, and, pers and pers imprisoned them, persecuted them and all, right? And then he was radically changed on the road to Damascus where he, uh, Jesus removed his eyesight, right? Talk about like you're just walking in this bright light, boom, and now you're blind, but that's not even it. Imagine a few days later when someone comes for you, lays hands on you and prays for you, and your sight is restored. That's the power that Jesus offers through the Holy Spirit to each and every one of them that chooses to commit themselves to that. In Acts chapter 13, 1 through 3, um, it, it talks about the calling of Paul and Barnabas to leave where they were at. Right? While, uh, I'll read part of it. While they were worshiping in, in, uh, the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me... For me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. So after that, after they had fasted and prayed, they had laid hands on them, prayed for them, and then they sent them off, right? Paul and Barnabas stepped out of their comfort zone. They no longer had that covering of people around them that would help feed them, give them a place to stay, listen to them, and everything like, right? 
they were called to go reach people. And if you know a little bit about it, a little bit more, Paul was called to the Gentiles, those that had no idea who Jesus was, right? They weren't Jewish. So there wasn't a foundation. It was a clean slate. Talk about something that's never been done before. Paul and Barnabas were the trailblazers of their time that began to spark wildfires wherever they went. See, the early church was uh, spread due to persecution, right? The stoning of Stephen. Paul and Barnabas, on the other hand, had it pretty good. They're comfortable. They were there. Good people, good food, good, good dinner. But they never left because that's just where they were at. But then the Holy Spirit spoke to them. The calling out of Paul and Barnabas was the beginning of the spark that began to flourish. And if you know, Paul wrote most of the New Testament. You see, this apostolic spark doesn't just happen. It takes elements that go, right? If you're going to start a wildfire, or not a wildfire, you don't want to start those, those are bad. But if you want to start a fire in a fireplace, it takes a few things, right? You can't just go, here's some wood and poof, there's your your fire, right? It takes a little bit of kindling, something that's really dry that can combust really quick, maybe a fuel or an accelerant. And then it takes a spark. That spark is what ignites it all. The apostolic spark results in a blazing inferno of God's kingdom advancing like an out-of-control wildfire. One that firefighters don't necessarily have to put out. Um, See, but that apostolic like wildfire that, that we're talking about, it only gets put out by us when we fail to uh, continue on kindling it. I'm going to present five catalysts. Catalyst is something that, uh, a substance that increases the rate of a chemical reaction without itself going through any permanent change, right? Fuel. It doesn't go through any change. It just burns and then it ignites. Five of them. So catalyst number one, you need a God moment. How many of you can raise your hand and say, I have had a God moment? Amen. Right? What did you do with those God moments? What did you, what did you do with it? Right? Nothing compares to the moment that you know, that you know, that you know, you had a God moment. Yeah. Yeah. I was speaking with Sally yesterday and she shared a story of when, when she knew God was speaking to her. And it was evident and she was like, ha! I don't think I've ever hit that octave ever before. I probably couldn't do it again. I'm glad it's being recorded. You see, you know God's Spirit has whispered to your heart and what you have heard. That actually made my throat itchy. There's no exact formula for this God moment, this experience that only God can, can have or give you. Uh, those who are open to the Spirit speaking to them will know that it is right. Right? So how do you know the Spirit's speaking to you? Well, one, you know how you think. You know your shortfalls. But when something comes to you, you're like, I never would have thought of that. Right? The Spirit's speaking to you. Yeah. When someone comes to you and says, you know what, Vicky? Like, God has a plan for you, and you need to step in obedience in it. Right? You're like, that was not God, that was Paula. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. Paula was, was impressed upon God. Is there a Paula here? Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> Paula, Wow. You got something for Vicky? <laughs> wow, that's amazing. You see, there's, there's no exact formula for it. Those who are open to the Spirit speaking to them will allow it. They'll hear it, but then you have a choice. When you think you've heard from the Lord, con con confirmation will often follow. Uh, that's, this confirmation can take a thousand different forms. You can read it in Scripture. You can be impressed upon it when you're praying. Uh, someone else, like Paula, can speak it to Vicky. Right? When I stepped into ministry, I had three people that, uh, two of them knew each other, but they didn't know them personally. But then three people say, like, you know what, you're going to make a great youth pastor one day. And I told every one of them, go ahead and, and shove it, go jump in a lake, because that's not happening. Because, like, there's just no way. Like, I know me, I know my thought process, and I know that God uh, will not use someone that is flawed and, and kind of idiotic at times <laughs> uh, to do something great. But God was like, <laughs> you know, and it goes here. Here's a, a thing. And so I, I can share more with that like after this if, if you guys have questions about it. But these God moments will change your life as long as you step into the obedience that um, it's calling for. Why we don't step aside 
Or why, why don't we set aside what we are going to do and pray and consider what the Spirit wants us to do? Right? We all have our own will. But how many of us understand and know that God's will is better even when we don't like it? Remember, the Holy Spirit will never, ever ask you to do something that contradicts God's word. So if you have a God moment, Scripture will back it up. Scripture will never tell you, put your mask on and go rob the convenience store. Because there's so much in Scripture that says don't do that. Remember that. Catalyst number two. A commitment to do something. When God speaks to you, you have to commit to do something. You don't have to have all the pieces. Right? When you open up a new puzzle, it's not put together. You have all the pieces, but it takes some time piecing it together to make this masterpiece. When you have a God moment, there will always be time to do something. If you hear from God, what am I going to say? Do something about it. It gets really old um, as a pastor or, or someone in, in charge of ministry. Right, right? We have some ministry heads around um, that you know, are in charge of different ministries. And you go and you ask someone like, hey, uh, Paula, um, you know, hey, we would love to have your help in uh, kids' church. Uh-uh. I don't do kids. I've done my... I've done my you, do you help with kids? That's amazing. But, but, but no, I don't do that. Like, I've, had, I've served my time. Someone else can do it, right? Well, I didn't know Paula wasn't breathing anymore because you serve in ministry until the day that you are called to heaven. The Holy Spirit is not done with you until you are no longer breathing breath on this earth. Like maybe you've heard this. Like I'm not called to do this or that. I'm led to this group of people, right? But I'm still waiting for God to open a door. Um, if God called you to that, that's the first door that's open. You start serving those people. You step up and you do something. God never gives you the second and third step until you make that first step. Or what about this one? I cannot associate with them because they sin differently than me. Right? Well, well their sin's worse than mine. How many of you guys understand that God calls sin, sin? It doesn't matter if you murder someone or you steal a piece of bubble gum. Sin is sin. It's black and white. There's no gray area. Why? Because Scripture says it. If anyone's offended right now, change the word to convicted. Like, I'm convicted by the Holy Spirit, and I need to work on myself to be better. When I was going through this and, and, and writing all this out, God was checking me in so many ways. So it's not just me speaking to you. Like, I've had to, like, chew on some of this for a few weeks now. So you cannot wait for the circumstances to be just right to do something. If you're a student, have you ever prayed for an A? Like, oh, Lord, give me an A. Right? Because if I don't get an A, my mom and dad are going to kill me. Right? But you don't put forth the effort to study to get an A. It's not magical. You have to do the effort to get the A. If you want to get closer to God, you have to put in the effort on daily reading your Bible and praying. See, the, the list of excuses can go on and on. We all try to justify our sin to work with Scripture and we pick and choose what kind of goes together and what doesn't, well, I don't believe that part of the Bible because that goes against what I believe as a human being. You're wrong. You just have to go out and you have to do something. Begin serving in a capacity on what God has called you to do. I like it this morning. Um, I'm going to use an example. I'm going to throw out names. Um, Sue Lynn was up here singing and her daughter Kylie walks in. And I, I'm sitting over here, like, you know, just kind of taking it in and, and praying and, and, and worshiping in my own way. Why isn't she singing? That's what I say. She walks right up and gets a, gets a microphone. I didn't realize she was going to take um, another microphone from someone else. But um, it happened. I'm sorry. Um, 
But the, the fact is, is that when you have an ability that God can use for God's greater good, use it. We won't and we can't change the world or the community by sitting around and waiting for that perfect time. When God calls you to something, take that first step in obedience and have the faith that he's going to give you the next step and the next step. Catalyst number three, a prayer siege, right? When God calls you to something, you have no idea what the next step is, but God does. Determined prayer can literally move mountains. It can change people's perspectives and it can change the minds of those naysayers that say that Jesus isn't who Jesus is. Matthew chapter 18, verses 19 and 20, it says, I also tell you this, if two or more agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am among them. A prayer siege is when you lay down all of life's affairs and you begin fasting and you take that fasting time, whatever you give up, and you put prayer in its place. If you want God to change your family, then you know what? You set aside time when they're all asleep. You get out of bed. You pray. Because God will move mountains when you believe and you pray in the Holy Spirit. A prayer siege goes beyond the weekly prayer meeting, right? I've had people come like, I pray in church on Sundays. Well, yeah, but you're not in church every single day of the week. What about Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right? There's other days that you need to be in prayer. A prayer siege goes beyond the weekly prayer meeting, the weekly prayer ser- or church service, uh, youth group, or prayer time. Don't misunderstand me. Those things are highly important and highly effective for who you are in Christ. Attend those. But a prayer siege is something where, where you do it behind closed doors, and it's just you and God. Because then, and only then, God will and, and can speak to you in a mighty way. And when you go pray for him, don't pray, God, give me a million dollars. God, give me a new house. God, give me a truck. Because God's going to be like, nope, nope, nope. Because one, you haven't said, God, use me in a way that I have not been used yet and can reach people to glorify you and only you. Get serious about prayer over difficult spiritual strongholds and pray for an extended time. All throughout the Bible, we hear stories of people that were waiting on God, right? About Abraham. Waited on God. God said, get up and go. He said, where? He goes, I haven't told you yet. Okay. So they pack up everything they have and just starts going. Noah, build an ark. But it hasn't rained and we're in a desert. Noah, you're an idiot. (laughs) But Noah began building an ark because God called him to. And what happened? Right? We all know the story. Get serious about the prayer over the stronghold uh, of, of the spiritual strongholds and pray for an extended time. Because God will answer your prayer, but he wants to test your faithfulness first. Because God can test you. He'll never tempt you, but he will test you. Catalyst number four. Sacrifice will happen on some level. We all have resources, right? How serious are you about seeing your homes, your schools, and your cities reached and impacted for Jesus Christ? How serious are you? How serious are you about seeing a change in the area that you've devoted your life? Right? People become teachers because they want to impact the lives of young minds. And if you know a teacher, it's not always easy. A lot of times, I don't know how it is here, but in California, like teachers spend a, a ton of their own funds to invest in their students because simply the funding's not there. It's a passion. Good. I don't doubt the seriousness of your heart, but I challenge you to make sure that your actions back up what you believe to be as true. Because your actions will speak louder in this culture of today than your words will. Right? We were all raised. How many of our parents says, you know, go do the dishes? Why do I have to do this? Because I said so. Right? Not because you're training them up to be like 
a cleanly person when they have their own place, but because I said so. How many of our kids have asked, well, well, why? Jennifer and I have devoted our lives to, if our kids ask why, we're going to explain it to them in a way that they will understand. So like whenever they start asking about stuff that you learn about when you're a teenager, um, my kids have heard stuff. And we've explained it to them in a way that they understand it because I don't want someone else teaching them about it. It's not their job. It's my job as, as a dad. The truth is, getting serious about the lost will cost you something. You cannot go into the woods, start rubbing two sticks together, in that brief moment, start a fire, right? If you rub them long enough, I'm sure you can start a fire, like it's proven. But your hands are going to be bleeding, and you're going to have a hard time, and it's going to get frustrating. But it doesn't just happen. It's a long process, and you have to devote time and energy to it. The breakthrough that you seek will not happen without putting something on the line. And it most certainly will take time, effort, finances, and possibly even your family. I'm going to use myself as an example right now. Because like I know me, I'm not trying to boast, I'm not better than you. I may be better than you at some stuff, but not you know, living life. Like There's some people here that are probably a lot better at me than that. But stepping into ministry, it has taken time. It has taken a lot of effort, a lot of prayer. It's taken finances. And it for sure has taken family. Because I can't serve ministry in a healthy way without the support and prayers of my wife and my kids being on board with it. I never would have put my kids or my family in a position of moving halfway across the country if they were not, yes, this is something that God has for us. From the moment I submitted the resume to to the Church for the Lost and Found, my kids have known, and we've been praying about it. It requires sacrifice on some level, but that's not even the sacrifice. They're in, but we have family in Tulare. And we are okay because God's will is better than our will. God's will is better than my family's will. And so if it's God's will, who knows? See, it'll most likely take your time, your effort, your finances. It'll cost you something, and it'll cost you your life. Because the moment you devote yourself in the Holy Spirit and to be led by the Holy Spirit and to serve Jesus the way that he is asking you to, your life is forever changed. You will do things, you will say things, you will be around people that you probably would never choose to be around. John Wesley said, It's not how much of my money I will give to the Lord, but how much of God's money I'll keep for myself. Think about it. If you're trying to reach somebody, the reason why we've had such a success in youth ministry is we devoted time and effort our own finances to taking them to lunch, taking them to to coffee or soda or a pop, whatever it's called out here, and invest time. We get to know them on a personal level. And whenever we get to know them, they start asking questions about us on a personal level. And once that personal relationship is there, the trust begins to flow and we can speak life into the young people. It takes time and it takes effort. I was sharing earlier with, uh, I think it was Sue Lynn and Kylie, that we have a a student that came through our youth group. She started when she was in seventh grade. She's a junior in college. I talk to her daily. Life. I pray with her. Um, When she goes through something, she knows that I'm someone she can trust and will love her through whatever mistakes or, or whatever is going on. Amazing things happen when you set aside your own time and put put aside your personal um, life. Now, I'm not saying always, but when you invest in that. Catalyst number five, you simply persevere. And the word simply is important because persevering can be difficult, but you simply persevere. There is something amazing about looking back after many years of work that you've put into something 
and realize how far you've come. And I could do that with my own life, and I'm sure you could do it with yours. We've all made mistakes. We've all you know, treated people poorly. But when we don't do that anymore, and we realize that we can go back and we can apologize, and we can make amends, and you're like, you know, look, look, I'm not perfect. What I said came out of anger or came out of, of unrest. But I didn't really mean it. My heart hurts. Will you please forgive me? I ask myself every day, how did I even get this far? Um, I've shared with my wife and a few people that know that I submitted the resume. How in the world would a church in Texas get a little California boy, or big California boy, I don't know, however you want to word it, but, you know, this far into a church? And the only reason um, I I ask myself that is because it's not about me, it's about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does amazing things when you trust and are obedient to what he's calling you to do. It will be hard at times, but don't give up on the dream that the Lord has put on your heart to reach people for his kingdom. Keep trying different things. Right? Every strategy that you can come up with won't reach everybody. When you mentor someone, you're going to mentor somebody differently than you're going to mentor someone else. But the thing is, is you're mentoring them. It's going to be hard. You might not see the end or even the next step, but always step forward in faith and be obedient to what God is calling you because that next step will be there. Even the Apostle Paul had to learn and persevere and endure. Right? He was thrown in prison multiple times, but that didn't stop him. He wrote letters of the Bible of, to the churches that are in the Bible from prison. Nothing could get the guy down. Not that we read in Scripture anyways. When your strength and endurance are all but gone, realize that God, the God who raised His Son from the dead will be there for you with that same power that He's given freely to everybody who accepts it. So if you don't believe you can move mountains, you need to work on your faith. You may be at the breaking point, but you've come a long way, and victory is right around the corner. Because the moment you stop is the moment that you are an inch away from succeeding in what God has called you to do so many times. I'm going to close with this. Stop relying on yourselves yourselves, selves, stop relying on yourselves and others and learn to rely on God all over again. Because everyone in this room will fail you at some point if you rely on them. But God will never fail you. His plan may be different than what you see, but it will always be good. So I want to encourage you. After we pray, after we're done here, and you get to to leave and go home, go with the intentions of setting a fire in your home, in your workplace or your school, in the community, and anywhere God takes you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much uh, for the opportunity this morning to be in in your house, uh, hearing your word and understanding that you have something bigger and better for every individual in this congregation, but as as a congregation as whole. Lord, I pray that your will be done in all of it and that people will see how and why they need to step up and serve to further the gospel right here in the little town of Dublin. Lord, because your will is, is just that. And we thank you so much for the opportunity to play a part into it. Lord, let your Holy Spirit dwell within us and let the baptism come out so that you can utilize us in a mighty, refreshing way, and let us be excited throughout all of it. Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. Amen.